What's going on here with 828 and this is Crossbeats Production and thank you for tuning in. So I want to share with you guys, I had a question that was asked on my channel not that long ago and somebody asked me, how do you get your tracks to be commercially loud? Um, I use air quotes because I think that that question is something that's really hard to answer in one video or two videos. Um, but what I tried to do in this video, I'm going to split it up into two separate videos because I need to cover off the mixing aspect of that question to then the mastering aspect of it as well um, and i just want to show you some techniques that i use in my tracks to get the track to sound louder um, and obviously competing with what's out on the you know the youtube or the spotify platforms and like stuff like that so let's go through this track and just show you kind of what i did to get this particular track up on youtube uh, sounding the way it did so i'll just show you what the track sounds like it's on youtube right now let me just play that to you quickly Okay, cool. Um, so let's go through some of the, the mixing. I'll go through the mastering in the second part of this video so I can cover that off. Um, but I'll just quickly tap on that a little bit. So first off, the mastering plugins you'll see here is the Alicia Mastering Alpha Compressor. Um, that's a fantastic compressor. Works really well to tame the peaks and also using it as a soft clipper. Um, I'm gonna disable that. The other thing I've got here is Pipeline, which is going through to my external hardware, which is the Antelope audio interface. Uh, and then that's going through a bunch of processing here, which um, not everybody has access to this. So I don't wanna use this as an example, but I just wanna show you what's going on in behind the scenes. So I've got the Gyrotech, which is like a tube uh, compressor. It really does add, like it's a very move style of compressor. So it adds a bit of volume to the track and also the character. Um, you can push it to the max as well. We've got this Lang EQ, which is, you know, affecting some of the EQ. Uh, and then I've got another EQ here, which is obviously the Poltec, which you guys would have known about that. It's just another version of that, which Antelope Audio make. And then finally the, the uh, Gyrotech again to increase some more volume. So that's what's happening on that side of things. I'll leave that on because it's helping increase some of the volume of the track. And then finally, I've got the L2, which I'm boosting a fair bit of volume. I may not necessarily use all of this gain. Let me just play it with it on. Let me show you what it sounds like. So I'm getting minus six. That's a lot of uh, gain reduction. Probably wouldn't do that um, if I don't want to drive this track that much. So I would probably back it off a bit. And somewhere about there is what you'd hear on YouTube currently. Um, the reason why I have it on YouTube a little bit lower in volume is because YouTube have obviously their own algorithms to have the loudness levels reduced if you have a track that's overly loud. So I didn't want to have my track to be turned down too much or if anything. So I wanted to watch that, that level that they have and focus on that. So that's why you hear it on YouTube a little bit less in volume. Uh, there's some things you can do to create a bit more volume in your track to get past some of that stuff. But let's cover off some of the tracks. So first off, I want to talk about the kick and the bass uh, because they're actually the driving force of this track. The piano obviously plays through the entire track. And then I've got a Rhodes keys as well. Um, but the kick and the bass really do drive this track a lot. So first off, you focus a lot on the instrument that you have that is the most crucial thing in your in your mix so that can be a kick it could be a bass could be a piano could be a vocal whatever it is in your mix that you really want to focus on that stands out the most to you that you feel like drives the track the most um, right now there's no vocal in this track there's no rap or anything like that maybe in the future there might be i don't know um, but at this current stage there's not so what i want to do to drive the track and be the driving force of this track was this kick here so I focused on a couple of things with that kick. I got the kick to sound good on its own uh, without any assistance. I really wanted this kick to be the best sounding kick that I could get for this track. And I wanted to get that um, you know, as loud as possible without it distorting and uh, to be focused and punchy. So I'll just show you quickly the kick itself. If you just zoom in here, um, you can see that the kick it really does have uh, quite a nice kind of uh, transient. So the transient's not messy at all. Uh, it's really just straight up there to the volume and then it just kind of sustains for a little bit and then just cuts off quite fast. And then obviously the tail here really disappears quite quickly. 
Um, there is a little bit of sound there, which you can kind of hear when the volume gets increased, but it doesn't uh, affect the way that the kick sounds there. Um, the other thing here is the snare. Actually, I'll just zoom in here again. The snare here, you can see the difference between the volume of the kick. It's quite loud versus the volume of the snare. And you can actually do that and get away with it because the way that the snare obviously sounds, it's further up in the register. Now, if I just show you um, the spectrometer here, and I'll just play the the instruments to isolate them. Um, just look at where the level of the snare sits when I play this out to you guys and just check that out. So let's play the drums now. Now you can see it kind of covers off pretty much all of the spectrum. The snare has a lot of sound throughout the entire spectrum. And I chose that snare specifically because this track was quite sparse um, and I designed it to be that way because I just wanted to have minimal elements in it. And I knew the piano would cover off certain areas of that track. So let me just play the piano because that's actually another good section of this track. Uh, let's go with that. Now you can see here the piano is kind of focusing the mid-range area and it's got a lot of free space here and some free space on the lower end so if I just play the snare with the piano have a listen to them together now they fill that rest of the gap the snare fits in that right right spot over there where that that section was free um, there is a little bit of overlap with the piano and the snare itself but for the most part because the snare sounded right um, and the piano wasn't too much in the high frequency register especially where the ears are irritating in this kind of two to five k area um, that it wasn't going to kill the piano and make it all you know sound crazy um, then the next thing that obviously i have playing in this track which i'll just play the kick on its own you'll just see how much low end frequencies are in this register around about 50 to 100 area let's play that and then below as well so we've got a lot sitting around about 50 and then from there there's another section here where it kind of peaks at 166 and then the rest of it just dips down where the high frequencies kind of sit um, there are some high frequencies but i'm leaving a lot of room here for the rest of that piano and the snare to sit in so everything is about fitting stuff into a box ultimately if you can get your mix to all sit in its own kind of frequency area uh, i wouldn't recommend going in there and you know high passing everything unless it's going to fix the way your sounds are sounding to sit in the mix. Um, but with the piano, I have, um, let me just focus on what, I, what I've done here with this piano. Um, I've got nothing, as you can see, there's no EQ on this particular piano, the way I've, I've set it up here. But what I have done is I've sp spread it around with this micro shift around the spectrum um, to kind of get it out of the way of the snare. So usually either one of two things happens with the piano either it's dead cent dead center mono um, which then obviously it's going to affect the rest of the frequency spectrum in the mono area or you're going to have wide sort of sounding piano um, i kind of did this on purpose with this micro shift so i could get that different kind of detuned kind of sound west coast kind of vibe to it um, but also i want to spread it further out of the, you know in the spectrum itself so if i just disable this and I'm just going to get another plug-in here. Uh, let's just show you what this sounds like, or what it looks like visually, actually, um, without that plug-in on. Let's play the piano on its own. Check that out. So, obviously, without micro shift, the piano is still quite wide. Let's throw it on there. Now, it's putting it a little bit out of phase, and this is not necess necessarily bad all the time. Um, if it was completely a minus one, then it probably wouldn't be very good in as far as the mix is concerned. But it's slightly out of phase, but when you're adding in the rest of the instruments into the mix, um, they actually are correcting the rest of the phase in the mix. So if I just play the entire track and show you what that looks like... So you can see the meter now is at plus one for the majority of the sound of that track. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, being out of phase is always a bad thing. So just remember, you know, if you're hitting minus one, you're going to definitely hear it. If you're, if you're wearing headphones as well, it definitely sits way out on the sides and it doesn't sound right usually most of the time. 
But as long as you have majority of the sound, I wouldn't ever do anything at minus one, but majority of the sound at least somewhere near zero or above, um, you're going to have somewhere that, you know, the track's going to sit somewhere in the mix where it sounds somewhat right. There's other tricks you can use with panning things so they can sort of go to the left and right and stuff like that um, to make it sound like it's wider than it actually is or just having dramatic pans or dramatic uh, phase shifts and stuff like that inside of the track. Um, but in this particular track, for whatever reason, it worked well. Um, it didn't sound like it was something wrong with it. That's how I wanted it to sound. So anyway, so that's how that worked on that side of things. So again, so let's focus back on the kick. Um, the kick was the driving force to this track. So I had the kick sitting in the lower register of the mix. And then I had this bass, which I'll show you in just a second. Let me just go into the, uh, the bass. All right, so we'll bring out the spectrum and we'll have a look at the bass and we'll play the kick in just a second. So let's play that bass and show you what that looks like. All right, so we had majority of that sitting at 68 or 62, 62.8 roughly, so 60, 60 hertz, let's say 60 uh, for the sake of it, because it kind of moves around with a different uh, up and down the chords. Um, but majority of that sits in that area, and you can see here the lower register is being kind of cut out. And what I did to get that to uh, be that way was I used this high pass frequency up to about, I think, where was it, 40. 46 um, and I high passed that so I could fit the kick in that space so I really wanted the kick to you know fill that area where the bass wasn't going to sit and allow the bass to breathe but sound you know nice in that regard um, but I used a bit of distortion which is quite often a trick that you can use inside of your mix to get your instrument sitting further up in the spectrum and to be able to allow the ear just to catch on to that sound it really is about for example, if you're looking, I'll just go back to the bass again as well. It really is about getting your sound, be it even low in volume. Like you can see here, this is, I think it was minus 20. So I'll just turn that kick off. It's about minus 20 where this bass is actually sitting. So that's not very loud at all when you think about it. But then when you're boosting it with obviously the L2 and the pipeline, which I've got all the other stuff happening there, um, it's going to increase the volume quite a bit. So let's just see where it sits here. Minus nine ish. So it allows me then, by using Decapitator, um, I'm actually getting the frequencies to sit further up um, just by using Distortion to do that. You can do that with other plugins. There's, uh, what is it, plugin that um, PreSonus make, which is Red Light District from memory, it's called. Um, you could use that as well if you want to use something that's free as far as a plugin for Distortion. Now, let me just take off Decapitator for a second. Let's just throw on this and see what it sounds like. It may sound very close to the... Uh, the old de decapitator. Let's turn that down. All right, let's go. So let's go a different sound. Let's go bad tube. So that kind of sounds a bit similar to the Decapitator. So you can use Distortion to be, you know, your best friend as far as the bass is concerned. Because if you don't want your bass sitting way further down in the register to get that kind of, that vibe of the low end, and you want your kick to be driving the track, definitely use something like Distortion. That'll help you get your, your bass further up in the mix. So anyway, so hopefully... As far as that's concerned, that gives you an idea of, you know, what's more important in your mix. Get that to be the driving force. Make sure the low end of the kick, uh, bass, or whatever it is, isn't overdriving the track. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when you're listening to the track itself, you'll start to notice if you have too much low end in the track, it starts to mask the high end frequencies. And if you're masking those high end frequencies, it's going to make your track sound like the volume is actually less than it actually is. Even though you have all this nice low end that's sitting in the track um, and it could be driving a subwoofer or something like that, the loudness that you'd perceive to be louder, which is up in this area, this register from about 500 upwards, um, that's where the mid-range frequencies really start and then you get mid to highs and highs up here. Um, you're really going to be, you know, if you're using all that low end, you're going to be cutting out some of that top end stuff that you really want to sit in the mix. So if you look at this full mix, I'll just play that to you and show you what it looks like. That's without the kick. And obviously if I'm letting the kick go back in, 
because the kick's not playing every single time, um, it's just forcing the, the track, like it's a driving force of the track. It's not masking the track 100% of the time. So while, while it's kicking, obviously you can hear that. It's making it sound impression-wise that the kick's punchy. Uh, but then when the kick goes away, obviously that's allowing that rest of that track to really sit there nicely. So first off, focus on the mix. If you have any questions, definitely ask me down below. I'm happy to answer anything as far as this mix is concerned. Um, and if you have questions about your mix and you want to kind of ask, you know, different things about it, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm going to cover the, the mastering side off in the video, uh, in the next video, because this part here, I'll just show you just one thing real briefly as well. Uh, I should just bring this meter right up. So just focus on how loud this track is before I send it into the mastering section. So we're hitting about minus nine. So if you think about minus nine, minus six, kind of that area, if you can get your mix to sit right, um, sound good, and be at the level of minus six, minus nine, wherever it sits, kind of as long as it's not clipping, basically, um, if you can get it sitting at levels where um, you can then send it to a mastering engineer, or if you want to master it yourself, um, you can get the mix to sit right, um, sound cohesive, everything sort of sounds right in the mix and then you can master it, make it a little bit louder, uh, obviously increasing the volume with an L2 or whatever limiter that you use. Um, using other distortion techniques as well in the mastering could help you as well. Reducing some of the low end could also help you in mastering, but we'll cover that off in the next part two of this video. I just want to share some of these techniques and tips with you at this point. Catch you on the next one and peace out.